Um, I was a Muslim. I was born in Islam and in a Pakistani family in Britain, as you can tell obviously by my accent, I'm British. <laughs> um, the Lord Jesus began a good work in me and I know he's going to complete it until the day he returns. When I was a young Muslim, I have made myself some bullet points here so I don't forget and I because sometimes I ramble a little bit. Um, the Lord Jesus, this is how it all began in 2001. Uh, in 2001, basically, I used to read the Quran quite a lot as a young girl, as a young, young girl. And uh, I would read the Quran. I'm going to... There's some parts of my testimony that um, I'm just going to say it as as um, as I recall the the events. This was 18 years ago. <laughs> I basically began uh, reading the Quran and um, in Arabic, in the um, Quranic Arabic, when I was young. My dad taught me the Quran. He taught me how to read the Arabic in Quran, which is very common. With Muslim families, it's usually that we learn everything we do about the religion from our parents. Our parents are very key in our um, our growth in the faith. Um, so my dad taught me how to read certain verses in the Quran from a very young age. I would say probably from the age of five. That's how early we start, around age five. Age six, age seven, we had to memorize certain verses in the Quran. I mean, this is all in Arabic, not in English. <laughs> Muslims pray and they memorize scriptures in the Arabic. So, um, by the time I was in my teens, my late teens, um, early 20s, I was reading the Quran as I would always, always do in the um, Arabic, the Quranic Arabic. And then it would puzzle me because I wouldn't understand, wasn't able to comprehend exactly what it was I was reading. And this is often the case with many Muslims, is that we can memorize all the verses from heart, from memory. We have all these, the volumes and volumes of Arabic prayers and scriptures that we remember, like memorized. Um, but we wouldn't really know what it is that we were talking about. We didn't understand the language. It's like... Hebrew, like supposing that um, we know the Bible in all in Hebrew, but we don't really understand the meaning because it's not our dialect, is it? It's not our language. So uh, English is my first language. My parents speak Urdu, Punjabi in the background, um, but mostly at home it was English. So trying to bear that in mind as I'm talking to you about what what it was about the Quran that I didn't understand because it was in Arabic. Eventually, I got to read the Quran in English because my dad gave me an English translation. <laughs> and then um, this is just, just bear in mind how the Lord Jesus works behind the scenes. When he knows the soul is really seeking the truth and we really truly are longing to know what the truth is. He's so faithful, you know. <laughs> um... Basically, the more time I spent reading the Quran in the um, in the English, because now I had it right in English, I would come across verses about Jesus, um, and I would compare him. This is the Jesus in the Quran, not the Jesus that we know in the Bible. So I would start to compare and contrast verses regarding Muhammad and Jesus, and I would question why. He died on the cross. I, I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense. The Quran didn't sort of, so it was like that. I couldn't find any answers in the Quran regarding this person, Jesus. He seemed so different, so special, really special, you know. Even in the Quran, you guys, imagine that. Imagine that there's a testimony of Jesus even in the Quran. Even though it's not the same, but it's it's a start, isn't it? That's how the Lord started on me. He started with the Quran on me. He sowed seeds in my in my heart. Um, eventually, I would, as you do, 
um, you know, like in street preaching. This is why I absolutely love and I am so grateful for street preachers out there. So if there are any street preachers out there listening to me today, I thank God for your life. I thank God for your life, honestly. If it weren't for them, I don't know how long it would have taken the Lord to get me to believe in him. Street preachers, oh, there goes my pen, would um, pass by me in the street, literally, on the trains in London, public transport. These faithful preachers would be out there, you know, just handing out sort of, you know, tracts. You know, they would give you tracts and... Um, spreading the gospel basically and it, this all began to happen at the same time when I was seeking the Lord and really trying to understand Allah, Muhammad, Isa like I was really searching I was a very young girl um, a little bit about my personality at that time I was considered in my family this is just <laughs> it's amazing how God does it I was actually the rebel in my family. I was considered the scapegoat, um, the black sheep in my family. I'm the eldest of four, four kids. And um, I was the tomboy when I was young. So I'll go, go through all of that. And so in my 20s, this is when I started seeking God. Like in, in my heart, you know, I wasn't religious. I wasn't a religious Muslim girl. I was spiritual, you could say. I was really trying to find out who is Jesus? Like, why is he so different to Muhammad? What's so different about him? There's something about him. So I would keep these tracts, these amazing little gospel tracts, and I would keep them secret. I would keep them secret and keep them safe. Because in those tracts, there would be scriptures and the scriptures would have verses about why Jesus came and died on the cross. But then I would think, but the Quran says he didn't die. It wasn't Jesus who died on the cross. But these Christians are saying it was Jesus that died. <laughs> so that was a contradiction already, right? Later on, obviously, later on, I obviously found out historically it's proven. It's a proven fact. But at this early stage in my sort of because uh, I had a very inquisitive mind I was very curious I had no idea I had absolute zero theo theological understanding I wasn't very good with religion I didn't understand anything about Christianity or Islam to be honest only from the Quran everything I learned was from the Quran um, there goes my cat Fifi what is some of the things that the Quran shares about Jesus? Well, funnily enough, one of the verses, I don't have it right now because it's been a long time since I've been in that book, in the Quran. One of the verses in the Quran, um, which stood out to me, I don't know the number, I will find it. It says that Jesus is, um, he's the spirit of God and he's the word of God, that the word was in Jesus. Not only that, it also says that he did lots of miracles. So when I was reading these verses in the Quran, I was like, wow, this man was like, he had so much power. There's something really different about him. He just has, you just gravitate towards him, if I can put it like that. You know, if that's the appropriate word to use. Um, I made those comparisons, but eventually what happened was, I got to the stage where because of those tracks, because I didn't have a Bible at this time, um, the internet wasn't a big thing in those days. Just remember, this is 2001. 2001, I didn't even have a mobile phone. I never had a cell phone. <laughs> I had nothing. Um, it's not like today, you know. Um, so I would, I would read these verses in these tracks and I'll compare them to the Quran. And not only that, Remember, I wasn't like really studying things out from the Quran because I didn't have a Bible. But what I did do was that I would really talk to God. Um, I would talk to him. But the thing is, my God at the time was Allah. And my, I just, I could not draw near to him for some reason. Like he was so distant. And all I saw was blackness. Can I describe it like that? Blackness, just dark. I would even question things like, if 
if we're saying that we worship one God, right, one God, why is it that my dad, who would pray faithfully, he still does, why is it that the Muslims are bowing down before a rock like a stone, the Kaaba? I just, something about that whole thing never sat right with me, even as a Muslim. I was very hesitant to learn about the prayer, because I, I, there was just something about the Kaaba, the black, the shrine in Mecca. Because remember, that's the prayer point, that's the focal point for all Islamic prayers. They pray facing um, Kaaba, Mecca. Like the Jews with Jerusalem, they face Jerusalem, you know. Muslims, they face Kaaba. So I would see this thing on the prayer mat all the time in my dad's room where he would pray. And I would just, oh, I don't know, it would just freak me out a little bit. I had a, a lot of pr um, problems with fear. I knew the spirit of fear was following me for many years as a little girl. I never liked being in the dark. Um, and for some reason, I just... <sighs> when Jesus, when those verses of Jesus would pop up, it would just do something you know, in here. I would just like, I wanted to know so much more about him, <laughs> but I wouldn't dare get a Bible. I didn't even cross my mind. Eventually what happened was I got to this stage where I began to believe the reason why Jesus died on the cross because this thing about him being the Lamb of God that these um, gospel tracts would talk about, they would say he's the Lamb of God. And he was sacrificed. He offered himself up and died for humanity, for all the world's sins. So I understood as a Muslim what sacrifice means. Literally an animal sacrifice because they do it as well, right? Because at Eid we would celebrate, um, there's two different types of Eid. One of them is where um, they commemorate Abraham offering Ishmael, not Isaac. And they don't really go into a lot of detail about that, what you know, why, the whys and all of this and that. Because remember, Muslims believe that they are the chosen people, not the Ish not the Isaac bloodline. They believe it's Ishmael. That's another thing. So when I came across this sort of, these scriptures about Jesus dying for the sins of the world, the Lamb of God, I was like, Oh, that makes so much sense to me. He gave me that understanding that I, I was I found it easy to believe. I was like, you know what? That makes so much sense. This is before, again, without having a Bible, right? So just through a few ha um, gospel tracks, I'm listening, I'm taking it all in, keeping them safe, snacking them in, you know. I would have a briefcase and I would hide them all in my briefcase at that time. As time was progressing, this is in the next coming months, um, I believed it. I believed it. I believed in the, the good news that Jesus Christ was God who came in the flesh. The word of God, because I had that testimony from Islam that he's the spirit of God. He is the word of God. And I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe I can believe on Jesus and still be a Muslim. But how will my family take this? I would have these, I would question a lot of stuff about it. I would like, oh my goodness, yeah, but can you imagine... I didn't know to the degree how bad it was, what I was about to do. I had no idea. I was naive. I was very naive. I didn't have any clue how bad the step I was about to take from, for the, my Muslim family, how bad they would take it. So I kept it a secret for five or six months. I would kneel in my bedroom. I would just sit there and pray and just talk to my Heavenly Father. <laughs> This was really like, I'm talking to the Heavenly Father. I would just sit and, and bow. One night, the night where I, I'd surrendered like to Jesus, his Lordship over my life, it was probably around three or four in the morning. I was waiting for everyone to be sound asleep. And I got out of my bed and I was in my bedroom and I bowed on the floor. I just, I felt like I need to be on my knees. So I was on my knees over my bed and I was just looking around like this, thinking, I'm going to come to the Father now in Jesus' name, in his name. Because according to these Bible gospel tracts, it says to do it in the name of Jesus. And so I did that. I don't remember the words. I don't remember the word for words, but I remember just saying, Father, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who became a sacrifice for my sins. 
I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Help me and my family to see you. Help us to know who you are. And I just, <laughs> it's like the the point. I'm crossing the line from the mis, from a Muslim girl to now be, believing in Jesus. It's that breaking point, right? <laughs> and then um, after that time, you know, this sounds so cliche, you guys. I know it sounds cliche, but I'm telling you. I received the peace of God from that day onward. I did. He came. He, his Holy Spirit came in my, and started to live in my heart. I know it. You know why? Because after this time, I just desired to get hold of the Bible. I was like, I need the Bible. I don't care. I need this thing. I need to read it. I want to know what Jesus wrote in there. So in the meantime, in the meantime, my baptism happens months later. It didn't happen straight away. In the meanwhile, I end up doing some temporary work in my employment for extra cash. Bear in mind, I'm still living with mum and dad and my siblings and everything. I'm the oldest daughter. Um, you know, so I'm keeping Jesus a secret. I'm keeping him a secret because nobody needs to know it's a personal thing, right? Until the day comes when I get this job and I'm supposed to be helping the local community town hall. And it was the general elections in the UK at the time and I was helping them with the ballots and everything. And um, it's, it's a town in London called East Ham. It's still there, this town hall. It's still there. And on my lunch break... <laughs> On my lunch break, because in my private time, I confessed that Jesus is Lord. In my private time, I had no, I didn't have no trouble with it. I knew he was God and eventually God would work it out. He would tell my family and, you know, he would save my dad and my mom. And I had it all worked out in my own brain <laughs> how he would do it. <laughs> this day, when I was at the um, the town hall, I was doing my voluntary work. Not my voluntary, it was a paid job. I'm sorry, I was working there. During the lunch period, there was this um, Pentecostal, I think it was Pentecostal, there was this gathering of um, Colombian Christians in the town hall, in, in the venue where I was working at. And it was a Pentecostal gathering, and um, I... I went into the main hall because I was I was nosy, I was curious, you know, Sonia and curiosity. <laughs> I peeped in and they were singing songs. They were singing songs. It was in Spanish though, or the Colombian language. I wasn't sure, but I just had a good feeling. I just felt really good. So I walked in and they were so excited. They thought I was one of them. They thought I was Colombian. So they said, come on in. <laughs> I was like, oh, what's going on? You know, I thought it was a wedding. I thought they were celebrating a marriage or something. And then one of the girls, her name was Angelica, and she came over and she said, am I a Christian? And I said, huh? Am I? And I looked over my shoulder and I said, yes, I am. And she said, would you like to come in? Do you have your Bible with you? I said, Bible? I don't have a Bible. I'm, so, I'm, I'm working. I'm actually working here. I'm on my lunch break. I was making all these excuses because I got nervous because I kept it a secret all this time and she said to me come over and she went she went and grabbed a bible and she gave it to me it's this one here this is the bible <laughs> she gave me this bible if I, I pray to God, I wish I could rewind and see this moment in history. I wish I could rewind. I just grabbed the thing from her. I went, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to just take it away and just go run off and go and sneak it in my handbag. I took the Bible from her and um, I stayed in the, in the service. I was still there. And then what happened was the pastor, the preacher... He began to do what we call now the altar call. And so when the altar call was given, I was looking around like, what's going on? What's this? What are people doing? 
and then I saw one person, then another person, and they were walking up to the front, and you know, they were doing what you call surrendering their life to Jesus. And then I was like, oh, I really wanted to do this because I had to make the public confession. Because late, I know why now, because later on, when I started to read the Gospels, Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. But if you confess me before men, right? So now I know why I felt like I need to do this publicly. I need to, like, not be ashamed. So after a while, after a few minutes, I waited for the people to do their thing. And I just wanted to go there and just do it. Just go. And I surrendered my life. I just did it without any... Um, I was nervous, I was nervous doing that because again, um, I'm in a Muslim family, I'm considered still Muslim and if anyone was to see me do that, they'd be hell to pay. So I just did it anyway, I thought I was in a safe environment and I knew God had set this thing up for me. He set it up so I would do it, you know. He gave me the Bible through this strange lady, he got me to confess and surrender, which is the right thing to do. You know, there's no such thing as secret believism in Christianity, no, no, no. We must boldly confess Jesus Christ. We must deny all false religion, deny idolatry and publicly do that and also publicly confess that there is only one God. There is only one name and that name is Jesus Christ. We must come to the place where we do that unashamedly boldly but at this time i was still very timid i was still very shy very nervous about this whole thing because i was keeping jesus a secret anyway so shortly after this this is the bookmark i got from that church at that time i've kept it ever since and um this is the day i was i done my you know i got saved i guess you could say um, it was uh, the first, it was actually Saturday the 2nd, June 2001. So I'll never forget that day, I'll never forget it. Now, soon after this, um, I began to go home, read this Bible. I mean, oh my goodness, you guys, I wish I could really relay this to you. I was so hungry to read the Bible I had this, I didn't know where to start. I'm like, I don't know where to, where do I? So I'm flicking through. I see the verses of Jesus I read in the Gospels. So I'm reading those. I'm like, oh, but there's so much more. And my thing was, I really wanted to know about Abraham. Because my dad and I, my dad used to tell me that the Muslim faith, the roots are in Abraham. He would say something like that to me that that's where it began. So the Quran never talks about that. It never says historically what was with the Abraham, what's the promise? Remember Abraham and Ishmael. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to go right to the very beginning of the Bible and I started reading from Genesis. Now most people, when they come to Jesus, and I understand why, they go to the Gospels or they go to the book of John, then they go to, I think it's Romans, right? And then they go to Hebrews. Is that called the Roman road, I think? But you see, I didn't have anyone help me. No, I didn't have anyone say, no, start here, I'll go there. So I just figured the best way to start a book is in the beginning, right? So I went to Genesis. I read the whole Old Testament. I don't know, it was in a couple of months, I think. It didn't take me long. It didn't take me long. I was reading this very Bible that I have today. In in between, I would go back to the New Testament and I would check things like, oh, I can't wait to get to the New Testament. Hold on, Lord Jesus, I'm coming. And then I would go back to the Old Testament and read. I found it absolutely fascinating. The Bible. I was getting so many answers, you guys. So many answers from creation. Why Adam and Eve were created. What is the deal with Satan? Because the Islamic thing about Satan doesn't make any sense. They, I'll, I'll, Maybe I'll talk about this another time. But the, the Islamic view of um, the devil in the early stages of creation is really peculiar. It makes no sense. Apparently, God told satan to bow down before adam and to like bow down like to worship adam 
But in Genesis, it says nothing of the sort. It's really weird. So when I was reading Genesis, I went over to the books of the law, and um, I understood a lot from all the books of the law, which is Deuteronomy, right? All of that, Leviticus. It made sense because, again, I'm coming from a Muslim background, and it's very religious. They have a very religious um, works-based thing, right? They're very similar, very similar to what the Jews do and what Muslims do. There's a lot of similarities there. Anyway, so in this time, I also discovered Christian TV on cable. <laughs> Christian TV on cable was there. And I would watch some of the channels in the early, early hours in the night while my parents were like sleeping. I would come downstairs and I would turn on the telly and I would watch... It would be on there, Derek Prince. I used to love Derek Prince's stuff. There were some preachers on there who are now, I remember, like, they, they're they prosperity preachers, and I kind of, like, shied away from them a little bit. But when I found Derek Prince, I learned so much from him. I really did. Early on, he started to sort of, through the Lord, he was teaching me about demons. But my heart was always about, like, where I wanted to focus was always on Jesus, like Jesus Christ. You know, I'm in love. I'm in. I'm. I'm in. So I'm in love with Jesus at this stage. I'm so in love with Him, and it's like a fire. You know, Jeremiah says, "You know, your word is like a fire. How can I hide it? How can I keep it a secret? It's burning in my heart. I can't keep it a secret." <laughs> These sort of things I would write in love letters to my heavenly Father. I would write little poems, prayers, there were prayers. And I would keep these prayers in my bedroom. And I don't know, I, I would hide them. You know, like I'd have a, you know, a prayer I would write and I would hide it to my Heavenly Father. I didn't know how to express this love that he was giving to me. I didn't know how to express it. I was still in a Muslim family, Muslim household. You know, we had Ramadan and I wouldn't keep, I, I wouldn't wake up to fast with my family. My mum started getting suspicious. Eventually, she found my prayers. I wrote to my Heavenly Father. She found them. And she also found my Bible. She found it falling out of my handbag one day. She comes to pick me up from the town hall. And this, this happened really rapidly. I mean, I'm talking about very quick, one thing after the next. Once my family found out, it was, oh my goodness. Um, my mum picked me up in the car and we were driving home and she asked me in the car, what do these letters mean? Who is my heavenly father? And I was like, what? She found out. She must have read them. And she confronted me, and I didn't say a thing, I didn't say a thing. And then she said, you're not even keeping fasting. Why are you not keeping the fast on Ramadan? I was like, mm. I never said anything. I was like really quiet. And she started to get really upset, very aggressive. This is how the demonic works. It wasn't my mother, it was, it was demons. Demons in my mum getting irritated with me. She said, you're not even denying it. You're not even admitting to it. What is this? What are you up to? We don't call Allah our Heavenly Father. He's not our Father. And Jesus is not a son of God. And I was like, oh. It was just, okay, this is it now. This is, okay. Right, it's just going to have to come out. I'm going to have to be prepared for this. She said to me in the car, as she was beating me, my mum's driving the car and she's beating me at the same time. She's like, mm, mm. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm just taking her beats while I was in the car. She said, you better think this through before you come home today. I'm going to drop you off and think about this because I'm going to tell your father. I'm going to tell your dad. And you better reconsider. He's, he's not going to be happy. So, um... I got really scared. I was like, oh my goodness, why is my mum's making such a drama out of this? What, what can I do? I didn't want to say no. I, I never denied it. I didn't want to say, I, no, mum, you misunderstood me or anything. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to have to just do this thing, you know. Um, 
At the time, I was with my ex, my ex-boyfriend, and he wasn't supportive. He wasn't, he was seeing the transformation going on in my life, and he wasn't, he wasn't supportive of it. Um, in fact, he slapped me for believing in Jesus. He actually went and gave me a smack on the face because it offended him. That's another story, and that's probably irrelevant to this, but, um, I was... I was, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but Jesus Christ will pull you out. He will just pull you out. He draws you out with his light. You know that? Even though I was considered a scapegoat and the black sheep in my family, um, the taunts I would get just increased after this because when I went home, my dad did confront me. He said to me, is this true? Is this true? Your mum's been telling me these crazy things. I just want to ask you yourself, is this true? And I was like, I'd never said anything. I was, because I would fear my dad. I had so much respect for my dad. Remember our culture, we just don't, you know, over here in the West, it's really like, <laughs> you know, we've got rights. You know, as adults, when you're 16, you've got rights. You know, you can tell your parents to shut it if you want. <laughs> But in my family home, the culture is very, um, what do you call it, shame and honour, really big deals in our culture. You can't just know dad. I was like, oh, dad, um, dad, you know, we can talk about this. I was very like, you know, and he was, he was fine. He wasn't aggressive with me. It was afterward, after this, what transpired. My mum ramped up a lot of the, um, the attacks against me during that time. She started to get all the family, the relatives to come over to talk sense into me. I would be upstairs in my room and then they would call me downstairs and just sort of interrogate me, you know? Interrogate me. Mind, mind you, at this time, I was only just at this time reading the Bible for myself and trying to understand exactly the, the history where Jesus came from, what's the background. So I was very young in the faith, literally a baby. I hadn't even been baptized yet. But my family, the relatives would be coming over, putting me on the hot seat and just asking me all these questions, really intimidating me. And I would just say, I know he's, he's God. He's the God of Abraham. And they didn't like that. I would say he's the God of Abraham. I said, no, but he is. He's the same God. He's, I understand he's the same God. Because... When, when I was reading the Old Testament and jumping to the New Testament, there was a scripture that really, oh my gosh, it was amazing. I mean, there are so many, but there's this one verse. Because when I would read the Gospels, in um, I'm going to read you the Bible, I'm sorry. With my videos, you're going to get a lot of scripture. I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> I was trying not to read a lot, but here you go. Let the Lord have his way. I would read things like this. Check this out, you guys. In John 10, as a very new believer in Jesus Christ, literally just crossed over from being a Muslim, I would read in John 10 when it said, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And if you go on in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And if you continue, I am the good shepherd, it says verse 14, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. When I read this section in um, John, John 10, you know what? I remembered I read that terminology before in the Old Testament. I was like, where did I read that about the Good Shepherd? Where is it? Because we didn't, I didn't use internet in those days. I had to go around all over the Bible, find it again. And I realized it was in Ezekiel 34. So I knew he was, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's all over the book. He is the God of the Old Testament. It's him. It's always been Jesus. Look at this, you guys. Um, Isaiah 34. I've got a bookmark of my family. Look. That's me. My sister, my brother, my youngest sister. I kept their pictures as a bookmark. 
Look, in Isaiah, this is why when I read the Gospel of John and it talked about I'm the Good Shepherd, Jesus, I'm like, but he said it before. He said it in Ezekiel 34. That whole chapter is about the Good Shepherd, that God is the true shepherd. <laughs> and I know there ain't more than one shepherd, is there? How many shepherds are there? There's only one. It's him. It's Jesus. It's been him all along. And I knew that it was him who saw Abraham. God gave me this understanding straight away. I didn't have a problem with it. So this is what I was trying to tell my family. No, he is the God. He's the one. He's the main one. He's created everything. And it says, I said, Dad, don't you agree? In the Quran, it says Jesus is coming to judge the world. Muhammad isn't coming to judge the world, is he? He's dead. And I would, that's when I would get slaps on my face for saying that. And I never said the lie, and where was the lie in all of it? It's the truth. Muhammad is dead, Jesus is alive. The whole thing about Christianity is that he's a resurrected God. He resurrected from the dead. It's amazing. It shakes everything, you know. The, the truth of the gospel, his death, his resurrection are so important, so important. Um, but again, early on in my, in my faith, I didn't understand there's so much the Lord was going to begin to show me. This was just at the beginning. There was so much more he was going to show me. <laughs> I was too eager. I was I was so hungry. I was so eager. In, uh, in Ezekiel 34, verse 11, it says, For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a, as a shepherd, seeks out his flock in the day he is among his scattered sheep so will i seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on the cloudy and dark day <laughs> it goes on i will feed my flock i will make them lie down says the lord god i will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away this is god the shepherd jesus christ the same one in john 10. isn't that beautiful isn't it it's beautiful Jeremiah 23 talks about that as well. But anyway, so here I am. I'm dealing with these family members coming over and then it culminated to the point where I was asked to leave. My family said that I need to leave the family home. And um, they couldn't accept that I became Gafir, apostate in Islam. It was very embarrassing for the whole family. Uh, my dad and my mum would say that I'm the only one that's ever done anything like this. It's the worst thing that I, that could happen to the family. Um, it would have been better if they found out that I was doing drugs or something. Something that they could contain and help me with. But the fact that I've denied Islam, I've denied my family. They take it very personally. To them it's like I rejected the Hulk, that I rejected the culture, the religion, everything. I'm like, no, I'm just going back to what dad, you said that our faith lies in the roots of Abraham. So Jesus is the God that spoke to Abraham. He's the same God, and I'm just doing that, and I want you to read it. I want you to read it for yourself. But um, I couldn't, it, it was just, yeah, it was difficult. <laughs> I knew that the father and son were one, and I knew his spirit was one. I just, I knew that that was the being that was with me all along. That it wasn't possible that Jesus could come and physically be present with me. But by his spirit, he's with me. I received that as truth. That's the truth. That's what the Bible says. He's the spirit of truth. He's the comforter. But when these things were really sort of um, getting heated at home, I, I, I had nowhere to go. All I would do is just go in the Bible. Honestly, I had nothing. I didn't know what to do. And I would read verses like this. I told you, you're going to get more Bible from me today. Every time I'm on, I can't help it. We're, you know, it's like... I'm just showing you how the Lord would speak to me through the Word. You know, I would open up the Word and it would be right there. You know, how many times has that happened to us, you guys? <laughs> how many times has that happened where, you know, we're praying on something, we're meditating on something, we open the Word and bam, the Lord is talking, right? We know this. And so he would say to me things like, <sighs> Now brother would deliver brother to death and the father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated. 
by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved when they persecute you in this city flee to another so i would read all these beautiful things and they would be encouraging to me they was like you know what it's all right i'm doing the right thing because it seems like what he's saying here if you're gonna follow me bad things are gonna happen <laughs> isn't it if you're gonna deny what you were what you had even so far as sticking up for the name of jesus even with your parents you're gonna lose it all I didn't want to try to save my life, but I didn't really know what else to do. I, had, I didn't know where to go after that. I didn't know. Um, by the time Christmas was approaching, December 2001, it was Christmas Eve when my parents had called the emergency doctor to come and visit me. The emergency doctor was called because, of course, they thought I was losing it. They said that I was hearing voices, that I was talking nonsense and so the doctor came out on call to see me Christmas Eve and I had to tell them that I'm absolutely fine it's just a domestic situation at home we're having a disagreement and the doctor said look if you need help call this number but I would just be in the room upstairs and when my family relatives used to come to visit to talk sense into me I would have to come back down and just sit there and just listen to all this stuff. They said that I would burn in hell, that I'm an apostate. They don't use that word apostate, they say gafir or guffar. Um, my punishment is that I should be dead. You know, in the olden days they would kill people with stoning. They, they, my family said that to me, that if, you know, if they could, they would stone me to death. And I'm like, I was crying, I cried a lot. I'm like, I don't understand. I was naive, I didn't know why they were so hostile to me. I just, you know, naive, I just didn't know. You know, like Jesus says, come to him as a child, a childlike faith. I was just, I believe he's God, he's Jesus, you know, he's God, he's alive. You know, he's not dead and buried, he rose from the dead. I believe this is true and I believe he's coming back. And the Quran says he's going to come back to judge the earth. I'd rather follow a man who's alive than the man who's dead. You know, God, he gave me some boldness even in the early days, you know, but I, I didn't know how to actually use my words at the time. But, you know, like it says in the scriptures, don't meditate on what you're going to say. Don't pre-plan it, just let it flow. Christmas Day, I knew that, um, because at this time, while all this was going on, I had siblings, so my family... Mum and Dad, my sisters, my brother, they were at home. And um, so my family were just getting ready to sort of have me leave. Um, I was contemplating on this, but I'm like, surely they don't want me to leave. Where am I going to go? I've got nowhere to go. I don't know any Christians. So my little sister, the youngest one, you know, she shared my room at the time and so she would see them smacking me, beating me. I'm the oldest in my family, it's very humiliating. And so she was worried. She was only, what, I think 12 at the time, really young. And she was really upset, like, what's going on, Sonny? You know, what's happening? And I'm like, I, I don't know, everything will be all fine. You know, don't worry about it, it'll be, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it, it'll be okay. And so I would see her, she'd be crying because she didn't, she didn't understand it. My brother was so young, he didn't understand it. He was in his early teens then, my brother. Um, but the night came when my dad said to me, you have to understand what you've done is really bad. We can't accept you. You know, you've got to make a decision. Either you, ca you continue with Jesus or you deny him and then come back to your senses. We'll get you married to a Muslim man, you'll be fine. You can forget about Jesus. I'm like, no, Dad, I can't, I can't, he's God, I can't do that. I can't do it, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for all the bad things I've done in my life. I'm sorry that I gave you so much trouble. I was a rebellious tomboy when I was young, Dad, I'm sorry. But the, honestly, this I'm not hiding anything now. This is the reason Jesus is God. And he's showing me himself that he's true. I just want you to please read for it, read about him for yourself. And he just said... He just they couldn't receive it they were just they just considered me mad they just said she's lost it 
you know, they couldn't reason with me and I couldn't reason with them. That night where my mum was going crazy, my mum's a very hysterical lady, she's very emotional. I mean, think about it, for her, she just thought I'm. she's lost her daughter, her daughter's gone mad, who's brainwashed her daughter, you know? They were so sure that somebody had put me up to this, that I'd been seeing somebody or somebody was brainwashing me. They just wanted, they wanted to pin it down to who got you to do this? Who told you Jesus is God? Who told you this? And I would say, God did. He showed me himself, Dad. If you, you know, I wanted to like, but I was scared at the same time. Telling them about how, you know, I prayed to the Father and he showed me the truth that Islam cannot be the religion because you're worshipping an idol. I told my dad, you're worshipping an idol, dad. That's paganism. It's not. How can you say God is one when you're worshipping an idol? And I got another. I got slapped and beat. That night, when um, I was going to leave, I didn't know what to do because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to go. I'm like, is this serious? Are they serious? They want me to leave. Where am I going to go? I don't know where to go. So I'm on the edge of my bed. I'm on the edge of my bed. And I asked the Lord, I'm talking to him, because so far he's talking to me. He's not, he's not let me down. He's communicating back with me. So I'm going to go to him, aren't I? Who else? I think I have a cell phone that I could pick up the phone and say, oh, I'm in, I need help. I had to go to the Bible. So I just said, Father, I don't know what to do. I think this is real. My parents really want me to leave. What shall I do, Lord? I don't know where to go. You know, I love them, you know? I was, I was a homely girl. I wasn't independent like some young teenagers and, you know, people in the 20s. You know, they have a sense of independency. They want to go and be independent, you know, leave the family home. I wasn't like that. I was very homely, a very homely girl. And uh, so just the thought of me having to just leave like that because they don't want me at home anymore. They hate me now because of what I did. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. So um, I opened the Bible. And this is what I, I read. Psalm 27, if you'd like to read with me. This is the first thing my eyes saw. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. I'm so sorry. So when I saw this, I just knew he was with me. He's fine. Everything's going to be all right. He's with me. He's spoken to me clearly. He knows that my father and my mother are willing to forsake me. And when that happens, it's okay because he's going to take care of me. So how can anyone tell me that Jesus is not God when I'm talking to him and he's talking back to me? That's no coincidence, is it? No, it's not. So I took a deep breath and I said, all right then. Okay, Lord, let's do it. I said, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. And um, I had a suitcase, which was just full of junk. It wasn't like, because I was never planning on leaving. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. It was just a suitcase that was just full of stuff that I'd accumulated over the years. I had to empty the whole thing out. I'm emptying it all out little by little. And my little sister, she's watching me in the bedroom. Like, she's watching, like, you know, what's son you doing? I'm like, I'm sorry, darling. I, I, I don't know. This won't be forever. This will only be for a short time, you know. Don't worry. I'm just going to go away, stay with a friend or something. But the penny dropped for me. It really sunk in because I knew. I'm like, this is it. This is what Jesus is saying in the Gospels. That if you want to follow him, you have to pick up your cross. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to pick up my cross. I wanted to stay with my dad. I wanted to stay with my mother. I was so, I had attachment issues, clearly. 
you know. But the Lord was allowing me to surrender in his time, you know, you know, layer by layer, layer by layer. I know I went to university a couple of years prior. I couldn't even do university. I was so homesick. I wanted to be at home with my mum and dad. I couldn't even do it. I dropped out. And here I was, you know, leaving. So, uh, I got a taxi. The taxi came and it's a long story, but I left. I left around four in the morning. I sneaked out while they were all asleep. Several months later, December, January, February, March, so within three months, in those three months, I was still very mindful of how upset everybody at home would be and what the community would be thinking because, of course, you know, it affects the whole community, the Islamic community, you know, they're saying bad things about me and that. So, uh, um, I would go home and I would just check in on them and then it'd be another argument and then they'd, you know, just sort of just say nasty things about Jesus, nasty things to me. And I would just leave again. I would just go home to test the waters to see, you know, are they calmed down now? Has their anger like settled down? Or is it still, you know, are they really angry still with me? But they were still very, very angry. Um, I couldn't tell them where I was staying because I didn't want to, you know, have any drama. For the people that I was with. Um, I found a church, I found a Baptist church and um, in the Baptist church they helped me because I wanted to get baptized. I was thinking you know it's been months and months I haven't done this thing that all the other believers did in the book of Acts. I need to do it. I think it's important. So I was telling the Baptist church like can I get baptized please quickly. Like I really want to do it quickly and of course you know being Baptist preachers they took me through quite a long process. I think it was six weeks process, like a training just prior to being baptized. I'm like, yeah, I, don't, I don't need it. I just want to be baptized. I know what it says in the Bible. I was just so eager. I was just ready to be dead and go to Jesus. I'm like, I don't, this is it. I'm found, I found the one, the one who created me. I found him. I don't want to live anymore. What's the point? I was like that. I was like, I don't, there's nothing this world can ever offer me anymore, ever again. And I just want to be with him. And I was scared that if I wasn't going to be baptized, then I might lose my salvation. I was like, you know, all the theology, because of all the Christian TV that I was watching. <laughs> anyway, the day I was being baptized was the day my mother found me. She found out where I was. She didn't find out where I was all this time, but she found out the day I was being baptised. Um, that Sunday, April the 14th, I believe it was, um, in my local town, in East Town, because I didn't go far, you see. When I left home, I didn't go far. I stayed close by, but they didn't know. But um, she managed to track me down. And on the day of my baptism, I was like, I was still having anxiety issues. Um, I was having anxiety issues. Uh, I was dreading that my family would turn up when they did. I was ready to be baptised. I was giving my testimony in the church and I was sobbing. I was crying my eyes out. And then I looked and I looked up and I saw my mum was sitting there and she had my auntie there as well. And my heart sank. I was like, oh my God. No. Not today, not on my baptism, please, don't do any drama, not today, please, don't try to stop me. I I tried to tell the pastor that I think there might be trouble because my mum's here, she's found out where I am. They were like, oh, I'll be fine, you know, it's glad, you know, we should be glad she's in church. I'm like, all right, okay, if you say so, but this is not going to go down very well. They were not listening, I was trying to tell them. <laughs> When I got ready to go into my uh, the baptism of waters, you know the you know the basin, I was stepping down in there, and then my mum came. She walked around, and she was cussing, she was screaming, cussing, having a panic attack, and all this vile language was coming out of her mouth about Jesus, and she was just saying these wicked things about Jesus Christ, and she she just 
basically cursed me out as well. And at the same time, Pastor Tony, who was baptising me, he just had his hands over my ears just to cover my ears so I couldn't hear that language, right? And he just saying, you know, I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I was saying, yes, Jesus, I'm coming to die with you. And when I raise up, I'm going to raise up with you your resurrection. I was saying my own prayers. I was trying to block out what my mother was saying. She was right at the edge of the baptism of water. She was right there going crazy. She was just cussing Jesus. And I was like, Lord, please forgive her. Forgive her. She doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't know. She thinks I'm lost. You see, so even my baptism moment. It was drama. It was so much drama. But the people that were in the church, they were they were praying in tongues. It's the first time. The first time, actually, I ever heard what it means to pray in the spirit or in tongues. Because these people that were in church, they were all praying in the spirit. <laughs> they just rose up. They rose up and they were... Oh, rabba, ba, rabba, ba, satara, right? They were just praying in the spirit. And I was like, what's going on? Then I realized it's a spiritual battle. It's spiritual what was going on there. I was crying still. I was sobbing my eyes out because I didn't want anything to happen to my mum. She was so hysterical. She said, I'm going to burn this church down. I'm going to get your brother to burn this church down. You rejected Islam. You've rejected Allah. You've rejected the whole family. And the ladies in the church were just trying to, you know, calm her down. Just like be nice to her. Try to hold her. And but she was just, she had superhuman power. It was demons in her. Not my mum. And then I went behind and I got dressed and everything. So that was drama, wasn't it? Um... But I was just saying, Lord Jesus, if you know, I just, Lord Jesus, I was just thinking something else is going to happen now, isn't it? So a family from the church took me in and I stayed with them for a season. And a rumor was going around that the local taxi firm had my photo and they were looking for me in the area. Most of these taxi drivers are Muslim. So I, would you believe this? I was, every time I would step out, I would be in disguise because I didn't want anyone to recognize who I was. It was a ridiculous time. That time in my life was crazy. Was, there's a lot going on there. Um, eventually I left London and I moved up North England and I stayed there for five years. And um, in those five years, I, I really, I grew in my faith. The Lord had to isolate me for five years. And um, when I had that time alone, I really got grounded into the Word a lot. I mean, He began showing me things in the Word, just, you know, discipling me. He was discipling me. There were good people in the church that I met when I moved up north in Derbyshire. There were lovely people there. They gave me a job. They looked after me. For five years, I was there. But I'd still had contact with my family. Um, eventually they tried to persuade me to come back home so I did I moved back home um, but I compromised you guys I compromised I um, they said you know we, we forbid you from going to church from having Christian friends and I would just you know they were going through so much that I just said I'll come home and I'll stay with you because if it saves your respect because they're they're the, in the culture, me doing what I did really ruined the respect in the in the community. And so my mum was sick. My dad wasn't very well. There's a lot of things that I haven't told you. But it's just, you know, I'll just say as the Lord has given me the words to say. Um, there were times when my dad would be very sick. In fact, one night he collapsed in his bedroom. This is just before I left when I packed my suitcase. He collapsed in his bedroom and um, he's diabetic, he has type 1 diabetes and it wasn't looking good, it was not looking good to my dad. We were worried that he was going to go into a coma. By that time I had memorised Isaiah 53 and I was um, confessing Isaiah 53 over my dad and I held my dad in his arms and I just confessed Isaiah 53 over him and he, my dad came around, he came, he, he got better. By then the ambulance turned up and my dad said to me, I heard you pray in the name of Jesus. I said, yeah. 
I did. I thought he was going to hit me again. <laughs> but he didn't. He didn't hit me. He just said thank you for doing that. I said okay. Alright. Um, <laughs> I'm just remembering different things now as I'm talking. Flashbacks are coming back to me. <coughs> anyway. Excuse me. My career, my social life, you know, distracted me when I moved back home. My walk became to grow more lukewarm. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I turned to music. Um, I, actually, as a little girl, I'd always liked music and I'd like to dance. As a little girl, I would always dance and just, you know, I would love to perform. I loved music and um, because of the prohibition my family put on me, because any time I would go to a church, they would find out and then I didn't want the church to get in trouble. I thought it was best that I just don't get any church involved and that because I didn't want trouble. I didn't want them to have trouble. <coughs> I'm sorry. The documentary, yeah, when I was working, when I came back to London, the Lord began opening doors for me, and I've never really talked about this on video before, but he gave me opportunities to share my testimony on um, very popular media outlets, under a different name of course. My interests grew in um, sort of <clears throat> political things, um, terrorism and what have you. I would want to work towards doing something like that. I knew that the Lord had a calling on my life and for various reasons the enemy was really trying to just take me off track. From, from the early days. Distraction, hurtful people, the wrong people came into my life, but the Lord still kept me, he kept me close to him. Even though I was drifting and coming close and drifting and coming close to him. This is why fellowship is so important. Fellowship is so important, you guys. You know, you can't have a relationship with Jesus on your own, you can't. We need one another, we need one another. We need each other. We need encouragement, we need protection, we need encouragement, we need support. And because I didn't have that, I was just throwing myself into my career, music, clubbing, doing things political, you know, because I was picking up these other contacts. I had lots of contacts in the media and I would do things behind the scenes that my parents didn't know about. And because of the fear of what my parents would do, if they found out, I stopped doing that stuff. Um, I didn't have any fellowship. But the persecution, the taunts, you know, how they were just black, 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 what do you call it? What's the thing? How they were just... <laughs> I was going to use the term in Urdu, but you won't understand if I say that. They were just... Uh, um, revile me and persecute me, just like Jesus said, you know, say bad things about me. And I took it, I took it, I just, I put up with it for so long. Secretly, I would still always read the Bible. I never stopped reading the Word. I never stopped reading it. I would always read the Bible because I thought, God is not finished with me. He can't have. He showed me so many things in those five years when I would throw myself in the Word. When I would do research, when I was on my own, I said, no, no, you haven't finished with me, Lord. There's more you want to do with me. He's given me this thing where I like to expose things and I, I want to speak up on it. It gives me a boldness. But I had this thing that I had to deal with, which was my fear. I was had fear of man. Fear of man was always there, creeping, you know. In my heart, it still burned for Jesus. I would say all these things I learned in those five years, I'm yearning to to release it all, you know. Um, but here I am now, 
now it's 2000 and what is it now 2019 and here I am and then the USA and then California so since then until today a lot has happened and I'll maybe I'll share that in another video how I ended up here there was um, three or four occasions where my my dad had me sit with the Imam from the mosque because they were so worried that I'm getting more and more stubborn in my faith with Jesus that they thought it, it would need, it would take an imam, the mosque leader, to come and talk to me about it. I think it was three or four times now. Once it was the same man, but three or four occasions my dad arranged a meeting with his imam from the mosque, and the other time it was a different man from the mosque to sit and talk to me about Jesus. Or about why I am wrong and how I've been brainwashed into believing that the Bible is true and when he came this is a bearded man Islamic man with the with the dress and everything coming into our house to talk to me and asking me questions that only like apologetics and people like that would be able to answer I didn't know any of that at that time I had no idea what to say I would just have this same Bible in my hand and say, well, look, it says here. And they wouldn't listen. They would not listen to me. There's a blindness, you know. But there's also a spirit behind this thing. Um, the Twice the imam said to me that my punishment for what I've done is death. And um, I'm, I'm a garfid and I need to die for it. But then he said something to my dad, like, well, you know, this is the UK. We can't, you know. So I know the seriousness of what I've done. I know it. I know the seriousness and I, I appreciate the concern the Muslim community have. But they don't know what I know right now, but they will. More and more people from the Islamic community are coming to the knowledge of Jesus. <laughs> if you just Google online, right, find out the statistics. It's in the millions now, isn't it? Billion? Millions of them coming to Jesus? It's amazing. What God is doing, Jesus himself is showing up to people in visions and dreams, to these Muslims. In the thousands, you guys. And the, the church is very highly persecuted over there. But they don't care. They don't care about their life. They're like, whatever, we found Jesus. We found everything. <laughs> He's the treasure. You know, he talked about the treasure in his parable. He is that treasure. He's the, he's the world's most precious treasure. And no one can steal that from me ever again. No one. I'm gonna, I wanna use the rest of my life now to serve Jesus, and however I can, you know? Whatever way. I see it that we've all got a talent, and I got one talent. I don't think I got many. <laughs> I got one talent, and some people have five, some people have 10. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna stay in the fear of man forever, to in timidity? And just hide it. Am I just going to hide the talent and just hope, oh Jesus, when he returns, I can give him back what he gave to me. So here Jesus, here's your talent. No, he's going to call me wicked. So I have to let my light shine, that one little candle, let it shine in the darkness and just keep doing it. But um, yeah, things just don't get easier, do they? They get worse. <laughs> But let's just pray that the Lord, um, the Lord allows his people to be bold. I ask for boldness in Jesus' name. I pray that more and more people will be bold for the faith. This is why I love watching street preachers. They're so good. They're very edifying. They're very encouraging. They show you how to stand up for the faith and really, you know, boldly, confidently in Jesus' name. You know, uh, I'm going to um, probably tell you all a bit more about why I started talking on video and I believe that the Lord has only just begun with me and this isn't the end. There's so much more he's shown me and I want to share it. I want to share it. Look guys, none of us knows the end of our days. I don't know how long I'm going to live. Nobody does. I don't know how long you guys are all going to be here. No one knows, right? I keep, I've put this off for so long. For years I've been putting it off because I was scared of what people will say. But I'm not going to do that anymore now. It's, it's silly. I don't want to be a coward. 
We've all got a gift, all of us. All of us are special in Jesus' eyes. He, he, he considers us so much that he numbers the hairs on our head. You know, we're all very unique in him. And what you have, I don't have. You know, let's treasure it. Let's do something with it. Now's the time. Jesus is returning soon. He's coming, you guys. I'm so excited. I can't wait. There will be a lot of time of trouble. Trouble is coming, but we have to be strong. We can't let anything shake our faith. There's so much deception out there right now. The Muslims have been going around for so long, for centuries now, tarnishing the Jewish people, saying bad things about the nation of Israel, Zionism, anti this and that. And guess what? It's contagious because now the Christians are doing it as well. You know, we need to stop this. Stick to the Bible. Literally, let's just read it like the news. Like we would check the news every day, right? It's really dangerous times we're coming in. I just pray that people will just be mindful of that. And I pray that the Lord will really wake us up. You know, he has a way of waking his people up. <sighs> you know? <laughs> I love you and I want to thank you for being here with me. And um, in a little while, I will um, catch up with you all shortly, okay? I don't want this to stop. I want to continue with my testimony because... Our testimony is always developing. There's always something good to testify about. Look at the goodness of God. Look what he did with, with me, just one person. <laughs> he showed me he's the shepherd. He showed it to me. He's him. He is the door, you know. He's the, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It's him. There is no other. There's nobody else. It's amazing. I love him. And I want to serve him. I want to serve him. You know. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you for being with me. I'm going on and on, aren't I? <laughs> I tried to make my videos short. So then more people will stay on and watch with me. I think if you go on a certain, you know, a certain time, people don't want to listen anymore. You know, people just want stuff handed to them. I think if I was sitting there talking about conspiracy theory, this, I'd have thousands of people listening to me. <laughs> But I'm just talking about Jesus and the Bible, and I'm like, oh, people get bored. Well, it just goes to show, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Nikki. I can't see who else is watching, but I thank you, girls, so much. I love you all. And let's continue to proclaim that Jesus Christ is God. He is Lord, and he's also the God of Israel. It's him. He's their Messiah, and he's coming back for them, and it's very exciting. <laughs> Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>